bottom of the line to the top, they all could be Dodge material. Remember, put a Dodge in your garage today. This time on Graveyard Cars. Mark and the Ghouls race to finish a one owner 1970 Super V that belongs to a decorated retired Marie. The guy that sent it to us is the original owner of the car. Bought it brand new when he was stationed in Vietnam. Will they make this former Devil Dog's dream come true? Almost there. Now, yeah, okay. Or face the wrath of a battle-hardened leatherneck. Marine, Colonel Gessup, right? <laughs> Tough guy. I wouldn't mess with him. Follow the journey of this one owner car as it goes from final paint to final destination. Coming up on this episode of Graveyard Cars. that's coming through the shop finally is a 1970 Dodge Super V. This is a 446 pack four speed car. It's a hard top WM23. Being a real V code and a D21 four speed, there's 599 of these cars made. But what I absolutely love about this car is that the guy that sent it to us is the original owner of the car. Bought it brand new when he was stationed in Vietnam. When I first saw the car, it was in pictures that the owner had of it when, over the years. And I could tell, like I say, that it was a really nice, clean, original car. And the fact that he's a, an elderly gentleman, bought it brand new, means he kind of cherished the car. All, all adds up to me knowing why it's going to be a nice car. Once we got it here, got it disassembled, sent it out and had it dipped and it came back, it was probably one of the nicest bodies. It might have been the nicest bee body we've ever had. It literally only had a small rust hole in the back glass in the Dutchman panel, which is very commonplace for these things to rust. That particular car, that's all I had. All the floors were beautiful. Trunk floor was beautiful. It really was one of the very nicest bodies to start with, which is gonna end up what? One of the nicest cars in town. So once the car was back, it was dipped, it was epoxied and ready to go, I handed the body off to Will, I handed the drivetrain off to Doug. You know, this was a really clean car to start with, which speeds up the process from start to finish. But it's been about a week in the metal shop to get some patchwork done around the uh, back window. And it was such a clean car, we were able to get it right over to the mudroom. I went over it with the body man out there. You know, it looked at every panel. There was no major dents, dings. Um, it hadn't been in a wreck before. So that this car went right through. He had it for about a month, and the car looks great. We prime and block every car twice. So when Michael got it over to me, got it primed, let it sit for a couple weeks to fully cure, then at that point, I can kick it back out to Michael, he'll block it one more time, then at that point, we're ready to take it apart. So with the final block being done, we're able to start the disassembly to get our jam work done. The cars go in B5 blue with the B7 blue interior. So the doors, fenders, hood, deck lid, door jams, all of it goes B5. So after that process is done, I give it about an hour, go back in the booth, mask off the doors, where they're supposed to be right behind the weather stripping, paint the B7, unmask that, and then I'm good to go to clear coat all of it. So at this point with the parts being done, I'm able to jump on the car, do the engine compartment, the door jams, inside the cab, inside the trunk, and get that done. So then at the next point, we can actually assemble the car.
It's important to treat the jam work like the outside of the car. So if I shoot the outside of the car at 27 pounds of pressure, I do the jams to ensure the color is going to match. So we take a, a lot of time doing jam work like it's the outside of the car, so it looks nice. And like normal, you know, we're using the PPG Deltron line, B5. It's a great color match. It's ready to go once you mix it up, and it's pretty straightforward. So with this color in particular, you know, it's five coats. And once I get that fifth coat done, I'll go back in, do two drop coats to ensure the metallic lays out nice. And then at that point, I like to let it sit for like a half hour, an hour, let it breathe, gas out, before I top coat it with clear. So just like the jam work, once I get the color done, let it sit for a little bit, I'm able to go in, start the clear coat process. It's a high solids product, meaning you don't want to put too many coats on too quickly. So I give it about a half hour between each coat, depends on the temperature, maybe even an hour. That way we don't have solvent pop or anything weird happen and it lays out great. So I put three coats of clear on. Once I'm done, I'll go clean out my gun, go back in the booth, kind of walk around, make sure there's no issues, make sure it looks great. Then at that point, I'll just run a bake cycle on it. Our 1970 Coronet Super B 446 pack is ready to get the drivetrain installed. Dougie's supposed to be over here doing a lid interview with me. Hey, Doug. I just want to take a second and show everybody at home that this engine is a little different than the any time, Doug. Right oh, over here. Sorry. It's like we practiced 15 times, right? 15 times. It, it doesn't matter. Remember, this is it. OK, it doesn't matter. This engine has aluminum heads on it. Uh, e Street, like the E Street band uh -huh. for Springsteen. Yeah. Remember them? Yeah. No adds 100 horsepower to it. But if you look at it, you can see it still has all the provisions in it. it. Has a provision for the alternator. If you go over to the other side, it's got no provisions. That's because a regular one wouldn't have them either. They're at the back. So when you put the head on here, it does what it's supposed to, and it accepts all the factory pieces. I just think that's cool. When you look at the engine overall, you see it's all Hemi orange. It, you wouldn't know those are Edelbrock heads. It's a sleeper. It's uh -huh. a sleeper. Uh -huh. Kind of like your sleeper. We had to put headers on it. It doesn't need headers. These manifolds perform just as well as a header. You don't remember that article? No. Cameras are over there in case you want to share with them too. Sorry, camera. Okay, let's put this rear end in. Dougie, raise it up. Yes, that's no. And drop down there a little bit. Installing the rear end in the car first is essential because if we install the engine first, the car could tip forward. You got that old super tray in there. So to install the rear end first, we tilt it up, bolt the spring perches in place, and then we lower the car down and put the shackles in and put the shackles on. So when that is done, we raise up one side of the rear end at a time so that we can put the shock on and bolt that in place. So the reason we lift one side of the rear end at a time and put the shocks on is because if we lifted them both, it would lift the car right off the hoist. So after that's done, we can move forward and get ready to install the engine, transmission, and front suspension. So over the years, you've watched graveyard cars go from assembly, well, you've watched this in the beginning with very little equipment. Over the years, you've seen us evolve and we've got the beautiful bin packs. We've got all the equipment that we've made ourselves, the frame racks the assembly install carts. But really, we're at a point where we've learned the best thing when it comes to putting these drivetrains in the car is to have that articulation that a forklift gives you, up, down, side to side. So it's just a real nice tool to have when you're installing the drivetrain. It gives us all of the latitude that we need to put it in a car without damaging or scratching anything and without us just killing ourselves trying to muscle it in. So I've talked about this in the past, that motor and transmission just went in beautiful. It's really nice when you have an engine that doesn't have a power steering gear on it. 
when it's a manual brake car. Reason why is it's just that much less stuff to put on for sure, but that steering gear makes it really hard to put an engine in one of these cars because it's a very tight fit. This is a manual steering car, so it's a much smaller steering gear and it goes in like a breeze. It's perfect. There's a ton of room on both sides. There's no chance of scratching a shock tower or a frame rail because of all the room that you gain by not having the power steering on it. So this transmission crossover for a four speed, I believe even maybe an automatic, is the same from 66 to 69. And at a glance, even the 1970 looks exactly like the 66 to 69. The difference is the size of these holes. What I'm talking about here on this transmission cross member is that prior to 1970, the cars, the majority of them, I, I don't know about A bodies because I didn't do very many of them, but your B bodies certainly back in 69 and earlier used a 7 16 bolt that went through the transmission cross member, through the torsion bar cross member, transmission mount cross member. In 70, they went to a 3 8 size. While a 69 and a 70 transmission cross member for say a B body look almost identical, they'll be different because of that hole size. You can clearly see that one is much bigger than the other one. Doesn't mean you couldn't drill it out and use the bigger bolts, but the proper thing is the 70 on up should be 3 8 69 on back should be your 7 16 Once we have the K-member in place and the torsion bars, the only thing left is to connect the upper control arm to the spindle and installing the upper shock mounts. Our 70 Super B 446 pack four speed car is moving quite quickly through the shop thanks to this young fella here. So far, the Super B has been a dream to work on. I mean, it's really a simple car. There's no power brakes, no power steering, not a whole lot of options on this car. But the key thing is how nicely this car came apart. One thing I've learned to agree with Mark on the better the car is when you start, the better the car is for assembly. We got the engine, transmission, drivetrain in it, we've got all the paint work done. Got, you got the dash assembly there. in yep. it, got the interior, uh, everything but the seats, you're working on yep. those right now. Uh -huh. And then you've got everything set up here for the back end of the car, which he doesn't need my help, but I thought it'd be kind of cool like we did on that last car to show you some of the things that are unique about a Super B and only a Super B. And then some of the things that are there that also share with just a regular Coronet, and that'd be the taillights. Yeah. Really cool feature. Okay, we're gonna put the right tail light in. Both these tail lights have to go in before we can put the trim panel on. Just to show you real quick here, he's reconditioned this part. You see that all this stuff has been reconditioned. What do you sandblast that? Sandblast and then tumble it. And then tumble it and it gives us that nice natural finish. We have a nice new gasket and then original lens. Original lens, everything repainted. And these are the same lens that a 70 Coronet, just a regular Coronet would have but not on a Coronet RT, that's a completely different. Let's go back to Torino's and look oh, at yeah. the finish panel. It's got the three strobe yeah. lights it's, or no, something like that? No, no, it's, but it, it does have a weirdness to yeah, it. Yeah, okay. I can't picture it in my head, but it's totally different. We also installed a new chrome trimmer and we got that from Classic Industries. So those are really hard to find original ones that are nice. Yeah. So yeah, that's Still just a beautiful, looking, yeah. beautiful light. I'll be an extra set of hands just to make sure nothing goofy happens. Very pretty. You went, you uh, went did I go way too far? That. Yep, there you go. You know, I know Mark is really short on time, but it's really nice for him to come out here and be able to, you know, just give me a little hand helping put things together on these cars. Is that a hole in your ear? Oh, you're right here? Yeah. Yeah, my ears used to be stretched. Why would you stretch your ears? <laughs> Mad at your parents? Of course, working with Mark always comes with a price tag. <laughs> this is a Stripe Delete car, B68, and it just gets the B. And I've actually got pictures of the original bees and where they're located on it. Aren't those cool? My little friends at Phoenix Graphics. I do too. It's going to be gorgeous. Can't wait. All right. This won't take on. You ready for another tail light? I'm looking forward to seeing the finish panel on this one. Oh, yeah. I love that. That finish panel's unique just to the 70 Super B. Only so, the Super Bs? So if you bought an NOS one, for a Coronet 440, you could certainly make it uh -huh. for a Super B. What about the, the Coronet RTs? They have like a full black panel. They, yeah, they? it's like a black panel, right. Yeah. So just to acclimate everybody with uh, the Dodge version of the mid-sized car. So in your Plymouth lineup, you had the Roadrunner. It was based on a Belvedere, which was the entry-level car for the Roadrunner. Then it can go to satellite is the next option up. 
sports satellite, then you get into the Roadrunner, and then the gentleman's muscle car, the GTX. In the Dodge lineup, it starts out at the very, very base with just being a Coronet. Then you have a Coronet 500. Then you go from that to the Super B, all right? So the Super B was available in a two-door hardtop and a two-door post, at least in 69 and 70. I'm not positive in 68. I just, I don't know that answer for sure. I do know that the Roadrunners were only available in a post in 1968, up through halfway through the year. Then they got really popular and started making them to hardtops. I don't know if that same rule applies. This would be a Philly State question. Mark, you left out the Carnet 440 model, which is in between the base Carnet and the Super B. Then you forgot to mention the Carnet RT, which is the top model Carnet. But to your question, 68 Super Bs were only available as a post model, the coupe version. Matter of fact, they didn't even come out until a little bit later in the year because Dodge saw the success of Plymouth Roadrunner and they were trying to chase it, so they came out with the Super B. Uh, funny point, earlier in the year, the people wanted to get a Hemi in the car net. You know what I'm saying, Petey? Oh, Pete busting a sweat over there. Yeah, a little tiny dancer on camera, show a little tiny. Kind of getting some fans. Old tiny people come in, they want to meet old tiny dancer. Can you believe that? Yeah, so this is pretty funny. Mark's not lying. On the side, I work live sporting events. And this last football game, I was holding the parab mic on the sidelines. And a police officer came up to me and said, hey man, I don't, I hate to say this, but are you tiny dancer? And I laughed and he laughed. He said, I love the show, keep it going. Everywhere I'm going, people are starting to recognize me as Tiny Dancer. Some of my friends are asking, why does he call you Tiny? Does that, nope, I gotta cut him off. It has nothing to do with what you might think. I'm a smaller guy and I like to dance. They wanna meet Tiny. I believe it. I, believe, I know, I guess. He's a likable guy. He is a very likable guy. I think we can go ahead and put the, the finish on panel yeah. on next. Let's do it, let's do it. This is the part I've been waiting for. Yeah. Let's lay that mother in there. But it's nice when it's an original part, it goes right back on for everything. Oh, if it's original. It's so nice. I think that one of the neatest finish panels on all of the cars that were ever made in the areas that I loved, which is 66 to 72, is the 70 Super B rear body finish panel. It's beautiful, it covers the whole back end of the car. The bad news about it is they're usually beat to death. They either have key marks from going in and out of the keyhole, somebody's bumped into it, dinged it, painted it, scuffed it, scratched it, done something, or it's just old. The one that came on the car was a very, very nice one, but it did have dents in it, it did have scuffs in it. The gentleman had waited a long time for his car for us. He's been very, very patient, and I wanted to do him a solid. I happened to have one that I had stored that was NOS. And there's just nothing, I have no idea what one would be worth today, three to five grand maybe. But that wasn't what it was about. It was making sure that when I was done with this car, it looked exactly the way it did when he got home to Arizona and saw it for the very, very first time. I think he deserves that. He earned it back then, he's earned it now. Look at that. So see how that finishes it? Just beautiful. Oh, what a yeah. great idea too. It just ties everything in with the red and the lenses. It's a simple car. Yeah. Really, it's a simple car, but it starts becoming kind of richer when it gets a little bit of that trim on it. Oh, yeah. That is absolutely beautiful. You should just love it. Just perfect. Last things on the rear lamps are the side markers. See, we got our brand new foam gasket there too. And this will just go in here real carefully. He can run the back end of it. I'll run that. Already looking good in there. Nice and lined up in that recessed area. So, so nice. This car has all original quarter panels, all original floors, trunk floor. It was just a mint body. Probably one of the nicest ones we've ever done. Beautiful. Look at that. Just clean too. Really clean. I love that. That stained pretty straight. No, yeah, it, it looks like square in the open. It fits real nice in the opening. Still to come, Mark and Justin forge ahead on the one owner 1970 Super B.
But will a snafu on Will's side of the shop cause a total mission failure? Will didn't paint the front balance. Son of a Willie, anybody see Willie? The 70 Coronet Super B, why aren't you painting that? Remember what happened in A Few Good Men? They questioned Colonel Jessup, you know, people die. I don't need that in my life. Can the team pull together to adapt, improvise, and overcome? Find out when Graveyard Cars return. So what he's gonna do is install the B right here. Now this is a picture we took before the car actually came apart. And this is the other side of the car. You can tell because this is a rear bumper. But it looks to me like the circle pattern itself is actually a little above the center line. There's nothing better than original documentation when it comes to reproducing something. In this case, Mark took actual pictures of the Super B decals before it went to the dipper. And then it looks like they've centered it right in the side marker opening, pretty darn close. And I don't know what that is, but maybe it inches all before yeah, you hit that thing. Yeah, so three quarters, so. If you want to put it on and just put lots of the slide on gel. Okay. And prep it real quick. All right. If you guys can't probably tell, but see the B is reflective. That's what that silver is in there. So if you would hit that with the lights. They did that on light up. almost as many of these decals as they could, didn't oh, they? Oh yeah. Okay, I'll get back and see what I got here. Okay. Boy, that's really. Is that pretty close? Really close, yeah. There's no real trick to putting the decals on a car. But one of the things I always compare putting decals on a car to is like hanging a picture. You know how you can go to the ceiling and measure? It's 13 and 3 eighths exactly to the top of the frame on both sides, that's where it goes. It measures perfectly until you stand back and look at it and it's crooked. At the end, sometimes you just have to stand back and dial it in because there's nothing in the world that's gonna replace the human eye when it says it's right or it's not. I think that's gold, Jerry. Gold. Tack it down? Yep. It'll turn them back now. No. Much easier than a billboard, though. Yeah, it is. Uh -huh. All right, you think it'll come off there? Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Look at that. Beautiful. Perfect. That's beautiful. All right, let's go put the side marker and the decal on the other side, and then we'll move to the front of the car. All right. Perfect fit. Love it. What do you say tomorrow we put the hood and the front bumper and all those pieces on it? Can the front balance go on? He forgot about it, so he's getting it painted. Will didn't paint the front balance? No. Son of a Willie, anybody see Willie? The booth? Will, the 70 Coronet Super B, why aren't you painting that? The front balance, I need that done. Yeah, I have a, that green car to finish first. Yeah, well, I needed that one a month ago before those other cars ever came over. Yeah, but you came over and said get that green car. This has everything. Right. To, you know why? You're not getting it done. I need well, it done right away. Because you've gained weight. My weight? And your Goldilocks thing's turning gray, too. There's nothing wrong with my... All right, that's it. Looks like tomorrow we can move on to the front end.
Okay, we're getting ready to put the front bumper on our 70 Super B. I've got the two muscle men here to do this with us. It's a heavy old thing, isn't it? So roll this up. I just want to take a second and show everybody. That's beautiful, beautiful front end. I mean, look at that. That's absolutely gorgeous. Looks like B-wings. I think that's yeah. the point, right? Looks like B-wings if you're standing back. Got the painted centerpiece, which actually has a chrome piece underneath it. We'll talk about that in a second. So yeah, you just stand back, you look at this thing, you think, wow, that's a, that's a beautiful one-piece front bumper setup. Yeah. <laughs> All original parts too, which is All awesome. original parts, right? We sent all the bumper work, all the bright finish out the chrome to have it re-chromed. There is a chrome piece, like I say, underneath this that really you wouldn't have to do because this painted piece goes over the top of it. But what I really want to show people is how intricate it is behind there. I'm gonna, why don't we rotate it around the whole, yeah, the whole thing. Just have you guys hold it there for a second. So you've got inner brackets, Inner bracket stay plates, which actually bolt to the course the eight inner fender. Yep. Outer brackets. Then you start working inside here. There's a lot of pieces and a lot of bolts. They're all new reproduction hardware. Well, the pieces that are on the bumper are all are all original to the car. Yeah. It's just we put new fasteners in. So here you have two individual rubber bumpers for uh, the stationary position of it once it's into place. An upper framework, a lower framework then you have these brackets that tie all the framework together and that's what the grill bolts into so when you see these little things that's the grill screws coming through from the other side then this is the piece we had chrome which is kind of a shame because it's completely hidden once you put the other piece on the outside of it but we do things right here at graveyard cars right here's a neat little tidbit for you so the center section between the bumper wings on the front bumper yeah, we had it re-chromed, beautiful. Then we covered it up with the factory shield because on a Super B, medium price class, it got painted body color. Another shield over the outside of it got painted body color, which I think is just really cool looking. Almost there, right there. Okay. Right there. So he's putting the lower or the rearmost bumper to frame brackets in place. And then theoretically we should be able to roll it into place and then push it into where it needs to go. Now one of the things we'll have to do later is you see the headlight buckets here, they have to line up perfectly in these holes. So if we put it in place and it doesn't line up perfectly, he'll take the grill halves out and then he can get in and get access to these bolts to hold it in place. And then they, he can move these around and put them exactly where they need to go relative to the bumper itself. Okay, I think we can start tipping it up now. Okay. Right there. How are you guys up there? Good. You Good. okay? You don't work out much, do you? No. You haven't been to the gym, but you're stronger than me and you don't work out. That's ridiculous. What do you expect from a guy who got a sponsorship from Umqua Ice Cream? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Frankenstein had one of those. Okay. All right, let's check it out. Pretty good. It's the filler. It's the filler? Yeah. Take a look at that side. Yeah, this side needs to go in about a quarter inch or so. Um, all right, we are going to uh, finish dialing this in a little bit. We're going to have to loosen up the bumper brackets and move it in a little bit more. So we'll do that. Yeah. Get it set exactly where it needs to go, and then we can put the balance on. Okay. Yeah. All right. But that's gonna look beautiful. Man, I can't, those are actually lined up pretty good without even. Real nice, huh? Yeah. So now we wanna put on the balance. I just wanted to show you real quick. This is an original balance. Nobody reproduces these. In fact, they don't reproduce much for these cars. But this molding right here, this is an original molding that we had polished. These are original lenses that Justin did a great job of restoring and polishing. 
If you roll that over, Doug, these are original housings, original wiring harness. And if you look in here, you'll see that this is all painted. That's because we don't want it to rust like the factory did. The factory was terrible about putting paint on the inside of panels. Why not go ahead and do it? Nobody cares. We're not going to an OE judging event. Nope. And of course, Dougie always gets a crack up out of this. And I point to things like the license plate. He thinks that's funny. Yeah, interesting. Well, he's smiling. He's not smiling. He's dead. He has no lips to conceal his teeth. But his teeth are smiling. So all skeletons are smiling? Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Duly no. Pete, you got that? Can you make sure they all smile from here? Death is funny to Doug? No, death is not funny to Doug. I just always think skeletons are smiling because they have no lips. You want to get the side markers in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll have to trade your spots. Oh, okay. And this thing's, it looks pretty square to me, so I think you're okay to tighten it. Okay. The reason we have four people here is because this is a very expensive hood. It's beautifully painted. It's got all the ornamentation on it, and we'd rather not scratch anything. Is that fair to say? Don't want to scratch anything. So Doug and I are going to take the front of it. They're going to set it at the back. We'll roll it up into position, and then they'll set the two bolts. And then at that point, you see how close we are. All of us should be able to walk away at that point and let Justin dial in all the gaps. Fair? Okay. We're going to try it. OK. Oh, that's a light old thing. I don't know what I was so scared about. Oh, Will's handiwork there. All right. So we're just going to keep the front way up. OK, up, down, back, floor, right there. OK. see where we're at yeah Here. i'll watch this back corner you guys watch your corners against the cowl that's looking a lot better back oh here. yeah that's much better boy the end is almost perfect oh here. wow yeah i mean the end is perfect no, here. yeah we uh, we don't need to come back over here we just need to raise it up a little bit in the back how's your height but in the you back? know what you can see is the bumper will have to come in about another inch. Yep. But that's the reason we didn't want to do it right now is because it all has to intersect together at the same time. So now that we have all of the body panels and the bumper in place on the car, I can step back and let the body men come back over. They're the ones that pre-fit the car. They're the ones that are going to be responsible to make sure that they dial everything in. In the case of this car, that front bumper isn't just a big cosmetic piece. It makes up the geometry of that front end. Those fenders have to be forward or backwards in space depending on where the bumper sits. And the bumper has to be forward or backward or side to side in space depending where the fenders are. So there's a lot of dialing in that last bit. And that's what we're gonna cut loose and let the body man take over. Stay tuned. With a one owner 1970 Super B nearing completion, Mark tries to bury the hatchet with Will. My point is, you've took a lot of shots, but it ain't about how hard you hit, okay? It's about how hard you can get hit. Then, with a Super B road ready, Mark sets out to cruise his old neighborhood and experience something he never could growing up. It's gotta be what it was like. I was too young. I was only eight years old in 1970, so I wouldn't be able to go in and buy a brand new car. But when the owner shows up, to collect his gorgeous 1970 440 six-pack four-speed, will his open-air trailer undo the ghoul's efforts to meticulously restore this icon of American muscle? He had this old, not-so-great-looking trailer that was open. I would never ship a car like that open. Find out in the conclusion of Graveyard Cars. One of the things I really look forward to is putting the new parts information and decals on these cars. I like to work from the back of the car to the front of the car. It's just a nice flow. I install the rear axle paper label with the part number. Parking brake cable tags. Reverse wiring harness tag. The jack instructions. the 
rear lamp harness tag. Moving forward on the car, I installed the door VIN label, the tire inflation label, engine starting instructions, locking ignition instruction sleeve and warranty card. Under the hood, I install the emissions label, antifreeze warning label, four lamp harness tag, positive battery cable tag, negative battery cable tag, and finally, the engine wiring harness tag. I just wanted to show you, because it's leaving here in a couple hours, so I give Will a lot of crap, everybody knows it, I'm constantly torturing him. I'm also okay to say when he does a great job. This Super Beast is phenomenal. I mean, it's flawless. And I'll say things are flawless because what you got to is TV land, right? And they're not perfectly flawless, although very few people in the world would ever see what I see. This one truly is flawless. So I thought I should give him the praise. Go over, bring him out here. I know he always thinks I'm up to something, but I just legitimately would like to tell him what a fantastic job he did and what I look for that makes me believe it's a fantastic job. So it, it started off really good. You know, Mark grabs me to do the walk around and it's like compliment after compliment. You know, it, it was nice to get the compliment and say I'm doing a great job, you know, nothing wrong with that. But however, I've worked with Mark my whole life. My point is you took a lot of shots, right? Oh you've yeah. Took, you've took an enormous amount of shots from me, uh -huh. occasionally from a customer uh -huh. doesn't like something, especially go back to the old Welby days and nowadays. But it ain't about how hard you hit, okay? It's about how hard you can get hit, how much you can take and keep moving forward. What are you reading? Not reading anything. Look, I, I try to teach through my comedy, okay? That's, that's what I do, I use it as a tool. Go to the ear with a point, go to the heart with a story. I just happen to add a little bit of comedy in there. It's my way of helping them to learn and to understand. In this particular case, it's about motivation. It's all about motivation. Who on this planet would be a better motivator than Sir Rocky Balboa? That's all I'm saying. He's a fictional character, Mark. He's not real. Oh, he isn't real? Is that right? I did not know that. Make a note of that. Rocky Balboa isn't real. Why don't you tell that to Clubber Lang? Why don't you call Tommy Gunn? See how he feels about it, all right? Or Dolph Lundgren, maybe he'd be interested in hearing that. Or Apollo Creed. Why don't you tell them how he's not real, okay? Or Mickey, you're now running up the stairs. So. Taking this car out on the road is an experience all in itself. And, and I'll tell you why I say that. For me, this one was more than just driving the car and shaking it down. It was a little bit of a moment. The car drives beautiful. It runs out great. The colors are exact. The, the B7 blue interior is just striking to go along with the B5 outside. I think that it humbles me when I realize that I'm driving a gentleman's car who served our country in Vietnam fought for our country, a hero, right? That bought this car when he was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed young man, had it sent home, and when he got home has enjoyed it ever since. I mean, that's really remarkable. And here I am driving the very same car down the roads that I grew up in. I wasn't in this service, but I respect the people that were. So this car is so close to brand new, it's gotta be what it was like. I was too young. I was only eight years old in 1970, so I wouldn't be able to go in and buy a brand new car but this has got to be what it's like. Rolling through the gears and it feels like it's supposed to. The steering, being manual steering, I would never have cared as a kid. As a grown up, 
<laughs> I prefer power steering, but I understand what Jim was doing with it. He wanted to go fast, all right? Rolling the windows up and down, changing lanes, checking the turn signals, hitting the brakes, swerving, weaving in and out around the camera car, just to check the agility of the car. It's a, uh, it's a fascinating time for me. I just had my 60th birthday. Don't look like it, probably look 50. To be driving around my own town in a car like this with a story linked like this. And we have other great, wonderful story, one owner cars. Uh, Mr. Louise's uh, 1968 Plymouth GTX, bought it brand new. We got the folks with the Dodge Dart convertible, bought it brand new. We have so many neat cars, and I don't wanna leave a ton of them out. But this is fantastic. It's a time for me to be able to bring their car back to what they vaguely have a memory of as it looked on the showroom floor or when it first got delivered to their house. I really can't be any more proud than I am now of our team that does a great job. Everybody from the front shop to the back shop is impeccable at what they do now. And I get to benefit from that. Doesn't get any better than that. Jim came out to pick up the car in person, so I had an opportunity to meet him, shake his hand, thank him for his service to our country, thank him for letting us work on his car. Uh, he walked around it, I walked around it, he had some questions. The guy's in great shape, works out all the time. Uh, he was crawling all underneath it. I said I can put it up on a bin pack and raise it in there. No, no, I'll get down, you know, Marine, Colonel Jessup, right? <laughs> Tough guy, I wouldn't mess with him. Uh, crawling all over the car just like he was 18 years old again, and absolutely, I think, loving it. Uh, my only concern was when we got outside to load the car up, because he came all the way from Virginia, I think, to pick it up, he had this old, not so great looking trailer that was open. I would never ship a car like that open, but I'm also never gonna question him. Remember what happened in A Few Good Men? They questioned Colonel Jessup. You know, people die. I don't need that in my life, all right? So he wants to take it home, take it home in an open trailer. He called me, he made it home. There was absolutely no trouble with the car, so he didn't have any dents, scratches. Next, he had a bug on the windshield. Had a little bit of dust on it, but you're gonna get that traveling 3,000 miles in an, open, in an open trailer like that. So, you know, some things are just meant to be, right? I think that was just meant to be. I think it was Elvis, right? So it was just meant to be, right? What's all the lyrics to that? Some things are meant to be wise, I don't know, something about a wise dude or something. Like a river flows. Like a river flows, gently to the sea. Darling, so it goes. Some things were meant to be. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, Elvis ain't got on me.